All right, so last week you were learning about permissions, which is a fairly straightforward topic, not counting, you know, the permission masks, which are gross. Um, Linux user management is actually fairly straightforward. It's the same thing that this has been around for years. It hasn't changed. This is the same as it was pretty much on the old Unix systems. Um, so a user, we should all know what that is by now. Now that Windows forces everybody to actually have a username and a password. You know, that was the biggest gift to, ev to security. Um, basically put, when you log in, it determines what you can and cannot do. It also determines what groups you belong to. When a user is created on the system, there's a series of information stored in a file called passwd. And it's stored in the etc directory. And a typical entry looks like username, and there's x, a bunch of other x's, yy's, and other info, the person's home directory, and what shell they use. That would help if I actually made it full screen. So when we look at the passwd file, the first field is the login name. So that's the username the person needs to type in to log into the system, whether it's root, whether it's a bunch of numbers, whether it's, you know, Daniel G. It's the name of you, it's your username. Field number two, password field. No, it does not contain your password. Wishful thinking. It used to, way, way back in the day. It wasn't clear text, it was encrypted. But it used to contain the password file. Um, the, and if there's an X in there, it shows that there's an encrypted password and it's stored into the shadow file. Somebody felt being clever and they store the passwords in the shadow where you can't see them. Field three is the UID number. So that's your unique identifier numeric wise of your user on the system. So think a bit like a primary key in a database. If you did it right, it's probably an integer that auto increments. In Linux, when you create a user, the ID goes up by one. It usually starts at 1,000 for non-system users. So 1,000, 1,001, 1,002. The next one is the group ID number. It's your main group ID. So what is your primary group that you belong to? So when you log in, who are you? That's your UID. What group do you belong to? That's the the GID. It has nothing to do with what other groups you may belong to, it's your primary group. So primarily what are you? Field number five is other information or a comment. Um, this is a weird string that contains a bunch of different information. You can have a person's nice name, in other words like your properly spelled name, uh, phone numbers, uh, what office you're in, there's all kinds of fields you can populate when you create a user and it'll get filled into that. Field number six is the default home directory. Normally when you create a user, the home directory is somewhere under home, and it's usually the same thing as their username. However, you can choose to name it something else, or you can choose to actually have the home folders not be under slash home. You could have it somewhere else on the file system. Um, not very common, but thing you can do. Or you could choose to give the person a different home folder name because you got two people with the same name at the company. And just what happens that it doesn't like it when you create two folders with the same name because that's something you can't do. Therefore, you can actually specify a different home folder for a user. The default shell. The shell is basically bash by default, but if you have additional shells installed, you can choose to give the users other shells, or you can disable their ability to log in by specifying no shell. Um, I'm going to pull up the user list in just a second that's on my machine so you can see what it looks like. There it is. Okay, as you can see, lots of text. And in here, there's a few different pieces you can see. Um, this is a user I created right here. 
This is my personal user. So there's my username. I have an encrypted password. User ID 1000, group ID 1000, because when you create a user, it creates a group that matches the user's name. A comma delimited list of potential values. So far, and there's just my first name. Shows that my home folder is this. And that my default shell is bash. Now, if we look at some of these other users in here, here's root. Root has an encrypted password, user ID 0, group ID 0. Home is in root, and it uses bin bash as its, as its shell. Uh, if I look a little further down, there's triple W data. For those that have run a web server on Ubuntu, that username will look familiar. That's the default username that is created on Ubuntu for Apache. And you can see it has an encrypted password, group and user, both 33. And it's store storing its nice name as triple W data also. Home folder is var triple W, not home. That's the home folder is not actually somewhere under home, it's somewhere else on the system. However, if you let the next bit's the interesting one, its shell is user bin no login. In other words, you try to log in as that user and it goes, no, no valid shells, see ya. And odds are you don't know what the triple W user's password is anyways, and you shouldn't. That's something you shouldn't play with. You don't log in as triple W data. And there's a bunch of others in here, but they all do similar things. There's the whoopsie user. And then there's the kernel loops. Kernel loops is when the operating system shits the bed. Stuff like that. Okay, so the passwd file generally requires root access to modify. If you're not root, you can't change it. And you shouldn't be able to change it if you're not root. Which leads me to a bit of an anecdotal story. When I was in high school, many, many moons ago, we, were, we had an experimental school where we got technology ahead of most of the other schools in Ontario. We had a computer lab in late 1980s. And when I went to high school, that was in 90, 89. Let's go with 89. In uh, 1990, we got the lab was completely supplied to us by a company called QNX. Some of you may actually recognize that company name. They were bought by BlackBerry. They have an office here in Ottawa. They were actually based here in Ottawa. They made Unix-like operating systems. And what was really cool about it is that it was a distributed network where they were actually running on 3D6 computers that had no hard drives. They booted off the network off this box that was sitting in the end of, in back of the room. And this is where I discovered the hacking for fun and profit. Um, I, the administrator books were all up on the shelf and I grabbed one one day and it showed that the ETC password file was where you stored usernames and passwords. And then I went and I was able to change the root user's password. But I wasn't a root user. Back then, security was pretty bad if it wasn't set up right. And you can tell it wasn't set up right if I could, as a regular student, go in and modify the password file. Uh, which leads to why we don't have a pass why passwords aren't passwd, they're in another file now. And this other file's locked down usually like, you know, Fort Knox. And I also learned the side effects of getting caught doing that, <laughs> which was lots of fun actually, because the prof was actually really impressed that I figured out how to do that. It was before you know the uh, you know the hacking for fun and profit was actually a thing. Um, usually, it was just hacking for fun back those days, but in Linux, you need to have root to access the past WD file. Oh, just to finish that story. There's one other point. I discovered that the uh, network admin, which was the math teacher, because back then the, usually the computer guys were the math teachers, because I don't know why computers and math equals they know how to work together, which he didn't. He never changed the root, default root password, which was in the book. So in the end, he had me put the password back to what it was. It was amazing. Uh, so yeah, 
just all that story, just say, yeah, on every Unix-like operating system nowadays, you have to be root to, root to be able to hit the past WD file in the shadow file. Um, however, what is special about it is the contents can be viewed by anyone. So anybody can sit there and actually look at the insides of it, which is why you can't see the passwords in it anymore. Um, you can change the content to have to do with your own account. You can't modify the file, but there are certain commands you can run to modify the contents of these security files. For example, passwd comes to mind. Imagine if you weren't allowed to change your own password, ever. It's a good time. You'd have to get root to change your password or get the guy who hacked the root files change your password for you. Um, all user passwords are stored in ETC shadow. And that file is only accessible by root or root processes. Nobody can look at it except for root or some piece of software running as root. Just like in Windows where you can't do certain things to other people's users without being an administrator on the machine, same deal. Now, the shadow file is the other file. So if we had passwd looks like this, the shadow file looks like this. And as you can see, there's a bunch of stuff in here, and I'm going to go through some what some of these are. The first line, the first column, is the username. That's just how it identifies who you are, where your password is. As long as your username doesn't change, you're good. Um, it doesn't use proper foreign keys and primary keys because it's not a database. It's just text files. Um, and it could, the next one is the encrypted password. If there's an exclamation mark before the encrypted password, it means that the password has not been set and or the account has been disabled. So if we look in here, I'll use this line right here. Let's see if I can make this any bigger. There we go. That's my user. And I'm going to make it smaller now because it's too long. This is my encrypted password. No, my password is not that long, but that's my encrypted password. If there was an exclamation mark in front of that, it would say this account is disabled. Done. Uh, so as root, if I want to nuke a user's account, I just edit the shadow file and jam a, an exclamation mark in front of their password. And the system just says, your account's disabled. Which is kind of a cute way of doing it when you think about it, because at that point, the string's no longer valid. It's not following the pattern what it would expect for an encrypted password. And what's really cool also is this is the root user's password right here. And what's really cute is that the, my root user and my main user have the same password, but the hash isn't the same. It's salting them so that even when they're encrypted, they don't look the same. The next line after that is, last time was the password changed. So what it tracks is the number of days since January 1st, 1970. Which, you know, a lot of people look at that and they go, that's a weird date to pick. Well, January 1st, 1970 at midnight is called Epoch. That's when we started tracking computer time, officially, where everybody agreed that this was day zero of the world of computers. So when we look at this, we see this number right here. My password was changed 17,904 days after January 1st, 1970. If you change your password multiple times in the same day, it doesn't track it any more granular than the current day. Um, the next one is a password rule. Number of days between password changes. Mine's currently set to zero. In other words, I don't need to change my password ever. But I could set that to 90 and make me change my make myself change my password every 90 days. That's a bit absurd. Or you could have the rule we have at the school, which is every nine months. Which is weird also. Um, 
The next one is the maximum number of days the password is valid, which in this case you can see is uh, 99,999 days. And the last one is number of days to warn the person before their expires, their, their password expires. So this one's set to seven. So seven days before my password expires, it's going to warn me. If I go over my password expiry date, guess what I can't do anymore? Can't log in. You got to get root to reset your password or at least reset your account. Um, now there's a couple more colons right here, right at the end. They don't have any values set on these accounts. Uh, inactive, number of days after the password expires that the account is disabled. Most systems have that set to one. So after your password expires, your account dies within a day. Um, a lot more systems have it set to zero days. In other words, the second your password expires, you're done. Same thing at the school here. If you get those password reset emails, do it. Um, otherwise, I think you're going to go pay a visit to ITS, and we all love waiting for ITS to help us. Um, the, because now it used to be you could at least get to an, onto a computer and change your password on the network. Now you have to go through Office 365, and if you can't log into Office 365 change your password, you know, um, and then expire. You can t say this account's only valid for a set number of days. So number of days since January 1st, 1970 that the account is disabled. In other words, if I were to set a date, it would be the number of days from 1970 plus whatever I want it to be in the future. Um, normally, you don't type in those values manually. There's utilities to do that. So you could, for example, you have a contractor that's working, a co-op student. There, let's use that as an example. Everybody in here cares about the word co-op. The number of heads that popped up, like, rah, there's like a bunch of gophers said, somebody said co-op. For example, when we hire a co-op, it happens every once in a while at my day job. We set their account to expire on their last day of co-op. So we don't have to remember to, you know, disable network access or disable their email. So it's kind of handy. So the first command we're actually going to look at is user add. User add with a series of options. I'll let you give you three guesses what it does. It adds a user. Self-explanatory command. Unlike a lot of the other commands you'll notice in Linux that are these, you know, shortened missing vowels. LS, CP kind of commands. User adds actually a complete word. Vowels and all. And it allows you to create a new user account. There's several useful uh, parameters. The dash D defines your home directory. Dash G shows your initial group name. So if you don't want to create a group that belongs to that user, you want to assign them to a global group. That's what you do. So for example, uh, anybody here ever looked at a Windows domain, played with a Windows domain, maybe seen what a Windows domain looks like? No. Really need to install Windows servers on a VM so you can experiment with that. Uh, um, when you create, when you have a Windows domain, by default, users are added to the domain users group. That is your default group on a Windows network. On Linux, your default group is the same group as your username. So you create a user called Daniel G. It'll create a group called Daniel G. But let's just say you want every single time you create a user that it belongs to a different group, and you want to create a group called, I don't know, just call it users. You could create a group called users, then assign everybody to users on the fly. Uh, capital G, supplementary groups. So if you want this person to belong to more than one group, uh, a common one you'll see is a user can belong to triple W data. That way, there, if you're doing web development on your machine and it's a Linux machine, you're able to save files into the var triple w directory. That way, you don't need to give yourself special permissions and you don't need to mess with the file system permissions if your user defaults to being 
part of the web server group. This is also where people start suffering because of the parameters. Because we have G twice, lowercase g, uppercase g. They do two totally different jobs. Um, dash C, that's comments. So you want a person's name? That's where it goes. Uh, capital N, do not create a group with the person's name. Um, it'll automatically add them to a group called users. So you create a user that you don't want them to have their own group. You could add to you know add them to the default users group instead. That's capital N. Um, I'll demonstrate a few of these things in a, f in a moment. Dash E, you set the expiry date, year, month, day. Just like in databases where you know you put in a date, and you should always do it from in decreasing order of magnitude, year, month, day. Don't trust the database server's uh, date parser ever. Just because Postgres is awesome with dates doesn't mean MySQL is. S is the login shell, as in what shell are they going to use to log in? M, create the home directory if it does not exist. This is an important one. This is when a lot of people make mistakes when they're doing this lab and when they're doing one of the scripting labs at the end. They always forget the dash M parameter. So you can go dash D to set the person's home directory, but if you forget, forget the dash M, it won't create the user's directory. And then capital D is the default values. So I'm gonna type, do a few examples. Now, if I create a user called Dan G, no extra parameters. No, nothing seems to really happen. If I go, it didn't create a home directory for me because I didn't tell it to. Now, if I go, You'll see that he created my user, and it shows that it set my home to slash home slash Dan G, but because I didn't tell it to create the directory, it didn't create the directory. All right, so I just use, I'll give you three guesses what user Dell does. It nukes the user. So again, I'm go go user add dash M dash D, because I want to get fancy. Um, I'm not going to set my initial group because I wanted to create the, the initial group, but I want to add them to, because this guy's a web dev, going to add him triple W data. And he's going to expire because he's a co-op, April 1st, and username is Danji. No error messages? Good, I did it right. Now, the funny thing is, is it doesn't always give you an error message. Just putting it out there, it doesn't always tell you something went wrong. So the next thing you have to do is to make sure everything worked right. So if I go, Home, you'll see there's my Daniel G folder that belongs to Dan G because that's the actual user. Let's make things a little more complicated, right? Um, here's my, again, here's my user. As you can see, user 1001, but the group is 1002. Because when you nuke a user, it doesn't nuke their group unless you tell it to. Now, if I look at the shadow file, you can see right here, here's my user. There's my exclamation mark saying, I don't have a password set. So Dan G exists. Dan G can't log in. 
Sucks to be him. And here's our Mike expiry date. It was created today. That's when it expires, which that's April 1st, 2020, by the way. That's the number of days since January 1st, 1970. And the password is not set to expire, and it's good for 99,999 days. I guess they just picked that number because they figured, what are the odds somebody will be around for, you know, 99,000 days? That's just a few days. So that's the user add command. There's really not a whole lot more you can do. Uh, the, da the dash C uses quote marks. The, these quotes have been worded or Microsofted. As you can see, it uses slightly angled quotes. They use real quotes. So the real quotation marks. So if you copy paste something like this, that won't work. Um, and I didn't set my default shell. If I don't set up a default shell, it defaults to bash. So there's user Dell, which I ran earlier. It nukes a user from the system. There's not much else to say other than, yeah, that's what exactly what it does. It nukes the user. Um, what it does is it deletes the entry from passwd and etc shadow. It does not remove the user's home directory. So when you delete a user, their stuff stays behind. Take it as someone who has to deal with um, disabling people's accounts. Let's go with that word. The uh, termination checklist. We don't nuke their user folders. We need to keep evidence if they did anything wrong. But So you don't normally nuke the person's home directory unless <coughs> you know it's all good. <coughs> the person may have stored personal files in there and you know they call you up the next day and say, oh, I forgot my pictures. Because they got stressed because they got walked to the door, that kind of thing. Um, or maybe you don't want to nuke them because the guy's got his project files in there and you need his source code. So that's, you know, why you don't nuke. User Dell is very straightforward. It literally has one parameter, nuke, which is the dash R. It deletes the person's home directory and everything inside of it. So to demonstrate, if I were to go user Dell dash R, Dan G, now, if the person never received Unix mail, which hopefully they never do, that's what this is saying. This is not an error message, it's just a heads up. By the way, this person never received a mail message. And by mail message, I'm talking on server self-contained mail, not Gmail. Uh, if they had something in there, then they would have nuked it. So now if I look at my home again, you'll see that Dan G is gone. The annual G folder is gone. And if I cat the past WD file, you'll see that that user is also gone. Yay for us. Person's gone. I'm going to recreate my user. This time I'm going to add an extra comment. So you'll see there's my nice name for my user. My home folder is there, and everything was recreated exactly the way it was before. So if we can nuke a user, we can create a user, we can nuke a user. Sometimes we need to change something about the user, but we don't want to um, actually delete everything. There, they create a command called user mod, which you can probably guess stands for user modify. Now, it allows you to modify most information in PASWD and pretty much any information associated with any account as long as you have the rights to modify it. So if you're a root, you can change the information about anybody on the system. Um, again, dash C to add comments, dash D to change the home directory. Now. This one's a nifty one, and I'll talk about it. I'll demonstrate what it does in a minute. Dash G's change your initial group. So let's say you created the user, but didn't give them an initial group. You can change them and stop them having their being part of their own group and make them part of users or part of something else. Uh, you can change what groups they belong to. Um, 
if the user is currently part of a group that is not listed in that list, they'll be removed from that group. So this doesn't modify the list of groups they belong to. It replaces the list of groups they belong to wholesale. Um, dash S changes the login shell. Dash E, well, change the expiry date. Dash L changes the login name. Now, dash capital L locks the person's password and their account. So if you want to actually disable someone, you do dash L. And dash U allows you to re-enable it. And I'm pretty sure that's a capital U by the shape of that text. So why'd that stay there? Oh, that's weird. So I'm going to go user mod dash D because I actually made a mistake when I created his home and he was supposed to be home, was supposed to be dang. Dash M, which is going to take the contents of the Daniel G folder, put them in the dang folder. And it does the things the smart way. It actually copies the files. And then gets rid of the old one. Um, the co-op is being kept for another term. So they now expire on September 1st. And that's the user I'm modifying. So if I do this, happens instantly. Now if I go ls... You'll see now that Daniel G folder became dang. And there's the fact that my home folder changed here also in the password file. And in the shadow file, uh, you can see that my expiry date's been pushed down. I still don't have a password set. Now, if I go show this again, now I've changed my password. And now there it is. So if, the, if I did the user mod again, but I decided to lock them out of their account, which is capital L, and I look at the contents of that shadow file, you'll see that it added the exclamation mark at the beginning. And if I do this again, and now I'm unlocked, the exclamation mark is gone at the start of the password file. It's like magic. I don't know why that slides in there. I thought I cleaned it out, but I guess I missed one. So the next one is CHSH. So we're back to the less than user, uh, the less than obvious commands. Because, you know, it would have been nice if they kept the streak with user add, user del, user mod. So CHSH stands for change shell. You can change what login shell is associated with the user account. If it's not, if you don't specify one, then it will prompt the shell for a shell. So earlier when we looked at the This one here, you can see I don't have a shell set. So I can go chsh dash s bin bash like such. And now my user has a, has a default shell set. If I want this person to have a less than useful pass a shell, I could actually just give them sh so they can hate you forever. And now I've changed this user's default shell to sh. Um, sh is very limited compared to bash. So, so far we talked about um, users. The other side of the users is groups. Now, groups is a way of sharing permissions across multiple um, 
people. So you want to set a, a default set of permissions, but you want a bunch of different people to actually have the exact same permissions, you'd use a group. Um, here at the school, if you were able to actually see your network account, you'd see you belong to specific groups. Um, not sure what they are for the students. You know, I belong to a faculty group, surprise. I also belong to a staff group, surprise, amongst other groups. Um, so depending on what groups you belong to, the permissions you know, are applied on a per group basis. And as you belong to at least one or more groups, actually that's not a good idea. Uh, there's a magnet there. <laughs> uh, if you belong to more than one group, the permissions are cumulative. In other words, you inherit all the different permissions and they all build up into one complete set of permissions that, that apply to you. And the group permissions, if you remember last week when we talked about file system and directory permissions. Shut up, Terrence. Between permissions, you've got user permissions, group permissions, and everybody else. When you belong to a group, the G sets the group permissions. So usually, users belong to at least one group. Sometimes they belong to more than one group. And somebody decided to get clever, and they created a file called group. It has a list of groups in it. And there's a gshadow file, because there's a shadow file for users. Guess what? There's a gshadow file for groups. And the format is quite different than the passwd file. Um, the entering group is group name, we'll list it, group name, password, group ID, and the list of users that belong to that group. So if I were to go again, a big long list in here. So these are all the different groups. As you can see, there's an ADM group. My actually my default user belongs to that. Uh, you can see a group called Triple W Data. And earlier I said Dan G was allowed, allowed to belong to Triple W Data because he's a web developer. So that means he belongs to this group. And as we go down, you'll see there's my initial user. There's Dan, the Dan G group. There's the Frank 3 group. And other miscellaneous groups in here with different users associated with it. If there's no user on the after the last colon, that means that it on that group only belongs to that user. So if there's a group, there's a group, there's a user called Whoopsie, there's a group called Whoopsie, there's nobody in the Whoopsie group except for the user Whoopsie. In the G shadow file, there's a little more information. There's the name of the group. <coughs> An encrypted password, because you can actually set passwords on groups. So you can actually give yourself, you can change your current active group if you want to. And if there's a password defined on it, you actually have to know the password. So let's just say you have a series of users that have elevated privileges, but you don't want them to always be able to access the system. As in, when they log in, they're not privileged right away. They can become privileged if they choose to be. And then what they could do is change their group. It'll prompt them for a password. And then they can become a privileged user. Normally, these are your, you'll see these for delegated network admins. Um, for example, you've got the root user. You may have two or three other people that work as administrators, usually not system administrators. They tend to work as user or mail administrators, and they're They've been given the appropriate group permissions to modify the mail system and or go into the user's home directories, that kind of stuff. And that's what the encrypted password's for. The comma separated list of group administrators. So if somebody's a group administrator, they can add somebody else to the group. Surprise. And then there's the list of group members. So if I go to cat like such, now you'll see. Here are all the different groups. Star has no password set. You can see that Danji belongs to Triple W Data. Um, LP Admin is disabled as a group. In other words, you can't 
switch into it. And LP admin, by the way, is printer admin. That means I'm allowed, my user is allowed to add and use a printer. Um, down here, Dan G has a group. There's no password on it. There's no admins because it's the guy's own group, but he can't even modify it himself. So I can't add somebody to my group without permissions to be able to add someone to my own group. It is quite tight. I guess we'll go with. So users belong to something called the initial group. So when your user first logs in, it reads it, your primary group. That's what's defined in the passwd file. And usually the administrator sets it if it's not supposed to be you know, a single user's group. Nothing needs to be done to modify the user. They belong to that group, end of story. And the person's initial group, JID, is listed in passwd, as I said earlier. A user can belong to several groups and at the same time, and you can switch between them for access purposes. So the some of the permissions are uh, some of the commands are group add creates a new group. As you can see, there's no arguments. There's group del. Again, no arguments. It deletes the group. Group mod actually has a few options. Um, you can set the GID by default. You can give it a group name. Um, you can type in groups with a username and see what groups that person belongs to. And you can change the group ID for a new group if they belong to. That's you, that's you changing your permissions. So if I go groups Daniel G, oops, not Daniel G, Dan G, you can see that Dan G, uh, let me clear the screen. Right there, you can see that the user Dan G belongs to a group called Dan G and to a group called Triple W Data. It doesn't list all the other groups that have exclamation marks in front of them because those are private groups. They're uh, system level groups. These are the groups I can switch between for permissions. New group allows you to, oh. new group allows you to change what group that's currently active. So if I were to become, Dan G. Oh yeah, that's right. I hate myself because I set myself to uh, SH. Very uh, plain prompts, as you can see. Um, if I go new group, and I go this, I am now operating as if I was part of the group of Triple W Data. I now my effective permissions are Triple W Data. That means I can go to. Eh, but I don't have permissions to actually get in there. <laughs> Go figure. Because Triple W Data is actually owned by root. Um, huh? If I go. Oh. I don't have a Triple W folder. That's why that didn't work. Duh. I don't have a web server set up on this machine. So when you change groups, it allows you to change what group you're in. If there's a password, it'll prompt you for the password. Uh, historically, I've noticed that this is kind of finicky. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, I don't know why, I'll be honest. Um, now, to administer group and the G shadow file, there's a command called gpasswd. <coughs> Not obvious at all. Because, you know, user mod modifies a user, which lets you set what groups they belong to, lets you, you know, change their username, their directory, stuff like that. For groups, it's G past WD for some unknown reason. They decide to put it all as one single command. Um, so argument dash A sets the group administrator. And a group administrator can or delete, add or delete users with s some of the permissions. Some of the options, I mean, dash A and dash D, they can't do the rest. Um, dash R removes the password. Um, so if I were to go uh, group add, I call it class. So if I go
Oh, I can't type today. So you'll see there's a group called class. If I do um, g pass wd, and actually I'll pull up the help file so you can actually see all the arguments because the slides don't actually show all of them. You can see that you can add a user, you can delete a user, you can restrict, uh, you can set the list of members, you can set the administrators. So if I were to go g pass wd, and I go dash a dan g, and, and, I, and I, the one I just created was called class. Now if I go cat, you'll see right here that the group class now has an administrator of Dan G. Um, there's also the ability to um, ch root. So when somebody joins a group, you can actually force them to go somewhere else on the file system automatically, which is cool. It sets their root folder to not be slash. It actually sets it further down so that even if they go slash, they're not all the way down. Their initial folder somewhere else. Um, you can add a user, so I could actually add um, to. Th so if I were to look at that file again, you'll see now that I've added that user to this group. Um, now, the next command is id. id is really handy. If I go id dan g, let me clear this. It'll show the user id that he belongs to, the group id that he belongs to, and the list of groups that he belongs to. That way, you know, you can at least list it fairly well. And if no users are specified, it looks at yours. As you can see, I'm root. I'm root across the board. I don't need to be anything else but root. SU, you've seen me use the SU command once or twice. SU is switch user. And it allows you to become somebody else. And it opens a subshell. So this one's a weird phrase when you say subshell. Essentially, it runs, so you've got your shell. When you launch as SU, it launches a shell inside the shell. So you're constrained by the outer shell. So you're basically building an onion of where you are, which is, brings us back to the who am I command. Maybe you won't remember who you are after a certain time if you're switching between users a lot, especially if you don't have different shell prompts set up, depending on what they are. Um, the, there's two arguments. Um, if you include the dash, so if I go su dash dan g, it says you want to use the login shell. In other words, you want to actually become that user completely. You're going to use their login shell, their defaults, their basic settings for everything. If if you ignore it, it actually keeps the current settings you have. So it'll in inherit uh, environment variables, different settings that are set up in the uh, in your environment. They'll take you'll inherit it from the current shell and bring them down to the inner shell. Um, most of the time, you want to do it with the dash. That way, you are really acting as that user, not mimicking that user. Um, the phrase that they used on the slides, the guy who wrote these slides originally, says you're switching personalities, uh, but not changing your environment. So if you use the dash, it changes what comp the environment completely you're operating in, changes the environment variables and everything. If you, ignore, if you don't include the dash, you're just operating as is. We're almost done, guys. So 
summarize. These are the commands, and these are basically what you need for uh, lab uh, four. Not oh, four. Lab four. Lab file is file systems. We're doing lecture four, lab four. Uh, the good news is most of the lectures match the labs. Um, so these are the commands you need for that lab. And this literally is, at least as far as my midterm goes, these are the commands where it ends. Um, again, I'm not even going to go over it again because obviously I just spent whatever amount of time, exactly one hour, going through them. Okay. Now, that being said, um, was there any questions about what I covered today since I got a little extra time? Yep. Yep. What do you mean when I ask you to become a person? No, no, it doesn't delete the user. I just, um, did you ever watch The Matrix? You know when, when uh, the agent basically takes over a person's body and they become that person? Yeah, that. Uh, not quite, that's excessive. But basically put, if I am root and I become someone else, I literally jump into their skin and become them as far as the server's concerned. I am, if I ask you into Dan G, as far as Linux is now concerned, I am Dan G. Uh, the permissions are, the root permissions no longer apply. Group permissions from root don't, no, don't, no longer apply. Environment variables from root, like as you can set up certain environment variables. Um, see, for example, I just typed in the env command. And you, let me clear this. I'll make it a little smaller. So here's my current environment. And it shows that I'm operating through xterm. I'm running a shell called bash. Now, you guys usually won't see this if you're doing it through VMware is I'm actually using an SSH client so I can actually make the font big for the screen. So I'm connecting remotely to a machine that's on my machine. Um, it shows that my username is root. Um, these are all the colors that are defined. So when you see certain colors, there'll be set, there's my mail path, here's my path. For those of you that have experienced messing around with your path in Windows for getting your Java installed to work, same idea. Um, I default to Canadian English, UTF-8. I, my home is root. Uh, I speak Canadian English, you know, that kind of stuff, uh, amongst other stuff. So if I were to become like that, now I type in ENV. Oh, let me clear that. You'll see the environment's completely different. I didn't inherit the environment from root. It's its own environment. There's his mail folder. There's my use that. Uh, login name this, xterm. You can't, this doesn't even know I'm connected using SSH. Like it doesn't even know I'm remotely connected. As far as it's concerned, I'm connected locally. It doesn't even know I'm coming from outside the machine anymore. Yep. Now this is the SU without uh, the da without the dash. As you can see, the user has been switched, the user home has been switched, but the fact that I'm still connected via SSH is, away, is there. It knows. It shows I'm connected via SSH here also. Um, my path is slightly different. That kind of X term is set to X, uh, the terminal is set to X term, that kind of stuff. It shows other settings. It, it basically takes the settings from root, merges them into the user, and if there's the if there's environment variables that are specific to the user, it'll overwrite the ones coming from root, but it also inherits all the ones from root that don't exist there yet. So it's as if you become someone else but retain your old memories, but you only remember memories that aren't that don't conflict with that person's memories. If that makes sense. Um, yeah, for example, I become someone else. I don't remember what I had for breakfast. I remember what that person had for breakfast. Because if we both had breakfast and I become that person, I don't use the dash. I'll remember what I had for lunch because that person didn't have lunch, but I'll remember what that person had for breakfast because that's what they had for breakfast. So it keeps only what's unique between the two, assuming that, yeah, the 
user you're SEOing as big into is the one you're becoming. Okay? Any other questions? Going once, going twice, tres. We're done.